This is the Ducati Desert X, a fantastic looking mid to large capacity adventure bike that they launched back in 2022. And I think it's fair to say that since then it's had pretty much rave reviews. And from what I can gather, basically anyone who's ridden it really seems to love it. The thing is, I am a little bit late to the party on this one. You see, I rode it for a short while on a media day last year, but that's pretty much it. And it was such a short ride that I've got to admit, afterwards, I was feeling a little bit underwhelmed. Maybe it was just relative to how good other people were saying it was. But look, thankfully, I've had this one for a couple of weeks to really get to know it and find out, is it really adventure bike perfection? As the hype would have me believe. But before we get started, I just want to say a huge thanks to Lewis Moto for supporting the channel and sponsoring this video. Lewis Moto sell a huge range of gear and parts and accessories online with fast delivery to the UK and free returns. Now, not only do they stock a huge range of over 500 brands, but also they carry their own in-house brands, which offer, in my experience, exceptional value for money. In this particular video, I'm wearing their Venucci VAJ1 adventure touring jacket, which I think looks the business and is super comfy as well as packing the reassurance of abrasion resistance and armor. Also, I've been taking out this tool roll from their in-house Rothwell brand and with 31 pieces including sockets and allen bits and torx bits and screwdrivers and pliers, you should have everything you need to get back on the road if you run into any minor technical difficulties. Genuinely, I've been super impressed with all the stuff I've used from Lewis Moto's own lineups and so do check out the link down in the description below to find out more. So let's kick off with the good stuff. In fact, I'd say the very good stuff. Primarily, I'm talking about the engine. This bike is powered by the Testa Stretta V-Twin that you'll also find and get ready for this list in the Multistrada V2 Road Biased Adventure Touring Bike, the Monster and Monster SP, which are the sporty middleweight nakeds, the Super Sport 950, which is like an accessible, slightly more relaxed sports bike, and also the Hypermotard 950, which is like a bonkers, hyper, supermoto inspired type thing. And so I guess the point is, it really is pretty versatile and it's not just a chugging plodding along dad bike kind of engine because it's also got that free revving nature and enough top end power to be used in a bike like the super sport for example then at the other end of the spectrum well it doesn't quite have that sort of unstallable feeling that you get on something like an africa twin but it is still plenty talky enough and pulls very strong all the way through the sort of mid-range. The other side of adventure riding is the sort of touring and motorway work. And I was also pleasantly surprised here because although it does rumble to life and it feels a little bit vibey when you're sitting there with the bike on its stand and it's in neutral, when you're at motorway speeds, you know, 60 or 70 or beyond, it really does smooth out and to me feels all day comfortable. Now the throttle is smooth but still super responsive and there's a great level of variety between the six standard riding modes. The clutch is like the gearbox precise and apart from first into second gear which I think is forgivable, you know the quick shifter is super crisp and smooth and it makes some delightful noises as it blips down the box along with a few tasty deceleration pops at the exhaust. Now, perhaps you could knock off a few points for fuel efficiency, which isn't quite as good as some of the other bikes on the market, like the Tiger 900 or the KTM 890 Adventure. But realistically, the 21 litre fuel tank will still give you enough range. And if you really do want to go as far as possible between stops, then there is always the option of that auxiliary fuel pod, providing you don't want to be specking luggage at the same time. Honestly, all in all, I'm a big fan of this engine. 110 horsepower is right up there with the most lively mid to large capacity adventure bikes. But I also think it has to get some credit for being a genuine V-twin. Loads of the other bikes in this market use a parallel twin with a 270 degree crank. And while they do feel, you know, really quite similar, still the V-twin does vibe in a slightly different way. And it just feels that bit more special as well as giving you a very slim bike. 
Now, I can't say I did any hardcore trails on this ride, but I did take in some unsurfaced roads and easy gravel, which I think is representative of the sort of stuff you might want to do if you're on an adventure tour. And naturally, it's an absolute doddle for a bike that's specced up like this, with spoke wheels of optimal adventure size, with a 21 inch at the front and the 18 at the rear. As standard, it's rolling on Pirelli's Scorpion Rally STR tyres, and in my experience, these are about as good as it gets when it comes to a tyre that's still good on the road, but also has a bit of that light off-road capability. Then you've got this super tall stance with the long suspension and 250 mil of ground clearance, and so it absolutely eats up these broken gravelly roads and 100% fills you with confidence. Now on top of that, it also feels to me like a very natural riding position when you stood up. And then this bike's very, very slender through the middle, right the way from the saddle through to the tank. And so it feels really very maneuverable and not at all cumbersome, which can be the case with some of the larger capacity adventure bikes. In fact, how I'd summarize this bike is that it feels in many ways very similar to the highly regarded Yamaha Tenere 700 in that it feels like a big dirt bike with a very narrow body. But thing is, with the Desert X, it's almost like that bike has been rebuilt from the ground up by a premium Italian motorcycle brand and with pretty much no cap on budget. So the spec of the components, the power of the engine, the tech and rider raids, the level of finish, and also, to be fair, the price are all a massive step up. That is only part of the job though, because adventure bikes have to be excellent on the road as well. And I think that's where Ducati have played an absolute blinder with this one. You see, I'm thinking back to other tall adventure bikes that I've ridden recently, like the Husqvarna Norden 901 Expedition. And while it was a great bike, I love me a Norden. You know, on the road, I did find it lurched around quite a bit under braking and acceleration. And I just felt so high up that you're physically and mentally a long way from the road. But thing is with the Desert X, while it does have a really similar stance, I feel a lot more confident pushing it through corners. And that's even despite the compromise of the tires because they're not fully road focused. And also despite that oversized 21 inch at the front, this bike still feels nimble and precise and just ultimately really quite fun to ride on the road. Then on top of that, you've got the brakes, which are top notch Brembo, four piston, radially mounted monoblock calipers, arguably overqualified for the dirt side of adventure riding. But on the road, you're absolutely glad they're there with loads of power, very crisp feeling. Another standout feature of this bike for me. It's also got to be said that it's absolutely comprehensive when it comes to technological features, with six riding modes as standard that allow you to mix up the traction control settings, the throttle response, ABS, wheelie control and engine braking control, all through this full-color TFT display which is mounted in a portrait orientation to give it a bit of that rally vibe. And I've got to say, it really does suit the feel of the bike, which, as I've said a few times, is quite slim and elongated. But also, the layout of the information on the screen is super clear and pleasing to the eye. Then you've got quite a few other nice bits as standard on this bike, like the quick shifter, cruise control, their emergency brake light feature, and also some phone connectivity, including turn-by-turn -turn nav. And to be honest, the only thing missing, especially on a cold February day like this, is perhaps some heated bits like grips and the seat. You see, you do get these as standard on some of the competition, and so especially considering the price here, which we'll get onto later, you might have expected them as standard fit, but then again, it is a Ducati, and so you know what to expect. Now, I think it's fair to say that I'm not the only person who really loves the way this bike looks. Right back to the original concept which they showed at Eichmer a few years back, you know, there was a lot of hype around the sort of semi-retro 80s and 90s Dakar kind of looks. And although that concept was actually based upon the Scrambler 1100 platform, I think it looks every bit as good in this sort of liquid cool V2 form. Now, specifically, I also really like this paint job. I think it's inspired by the Audi Qtron. Audi are, of course, the group owner of Ducati. And I believe it's some sort of electric rally or Dakar kind of car. I'm not massively into cars, but it does look very nice on the bike as well. Possibly even better, I'd say, than the original white and red version, which was, of course, referencing bikes like the Kajiva Elephant. What I really like, though, about this bike and why I think it looks so good is because actually when you look around it, there isn't that much design detail and fanciness. It's all quite utilitarian looking. It's got a big front wheel, a big rear wheel, 
full suspension, knobbly tires, it's got the spokes, it's got a little bit of protection underneath, the exhaust flicks up high to make sure that it's, you know, clear of water and that kind of thing. You've got that slim tail section with the bolt on subframe, a big fuel tank as well, which gives it that sort of big shouldered look. And really styling wise, it's only the windscreen, the distinctive headlights, and then a little bit of bodywork around here that sort of finish it off. But that's the key, I think. Adventure bikes should look utilitarian and sort of rugged and a little bit bare bones. And I think this bike does it pretty much better than any other adventure bike. So look, the strengths of this bike are plentiful, but I think in building something so off-road capable, naturally they've had to trade off a little bit of comfort out on the road. The slimness of the cockpit isn't going to give you the most wind protection on the market, and so it does feel a little less cocoon perhaps than some of the other bikes that flare out more at the tank and have a larger adjustable windscreen. Then you've got the saddle, which again is narrow, and while that does make it a little bit easier to get your feet down, and also to move your body weight around with plenty of space for your knees, you know, it isn't exactly an armchair on wheels. The padding is pretty firm, and there isn't that much surface area to distribute your weight over and so after a couple of hours in the saddle while i do find the bar position and the peg position and the general rider triangle pretty good it's the butt that starts to complain the other thing as well is that this is a pretty tall bike at 875 millimeters in the seat and while it does give it that sort of extra off-road ability and the ground clearance and the suspension travel you know really if you're just going to be riding it on the road for sure riders you might be better off with something like a multistrada v2 i'm five foot nine or 175 centimeters and i certainly have to get you know one butt cheek over to the side of the saddle to get a foot firmly planted when i come to a stop and look while there are some options in the accessories catalog to go either up or down with the seat in standard form i'm just saying it's quite tall <laughs> Ultimately though, I think if you want a bike like this that's both fantastic on-road and off, then I think most people are probably willing to accept that it's going to be a tallish bike and probably not going to be the most comprehensive in terms of saddle cushiness and keeping you out of the wind. Really, once you've accepted all that, the main obstacle is probably going to be the price, which for the base model, even without this fancy paint job that's another 500 quid, is £14,995. That plants it very firmly at the top end of the price spectrum for a sub 1000cc adventure bike and it's three grand more than BMW's new updated 2024 F900 GS over two grand more than a KTM 890 Adventure or a Norden 901 and still 500 quid more than a Triumph Tiger 900 Rally Pro which is absolutely dripping with parts from the accessories catalogue, including stuff like crash bars, heated seats and grips, and auxiliary lights as standard. So the question remains, is this the perfect adventure bike? Well, I guess not, but I think that's purely because of the fundamental nature of trade-offs. If a bike's super off-roady and tall, then it isn't realistically going to be that comfort biased. And if you do want the very best components, a comprehensive tech package and beautiful design, all from a premium Italian brand, then my friends, well, it ain't going to be cheap. But what I can say is this. Even on a crummy, cold, windy, wet day on top of a hill somewhere in Wales, I got back to the studio thinking, mm, I get it now. I get why everyone seems to love it so much. And I challenge anyone who gets a decent ride on one of these to not end up wanting one. Please do let me know in the comments below if you've got any ideas for ways to quickly generate £15,000, as well as what you think of the bike, especially versus the competition. Also, if you're one of the very, very few people who'll find this bike too small, then I'd also recommend checking out the Rally Edition, which is even taller and even more off-road biased. And I've got a full lowdown of the details on the screen now, so you can give it a click and give it a watch in case you haven't already. Also, hit subscribe if you want to see more of the latest motorcycle reviews like this right here on YouTube. Many thanks for watching today and we'll catch you in the next video.